24th of January, 1962. The mother reads, Not only is there hope for Godheads pure, the violent and darkened deities leap down from the one breast in rage to find what the white gods had missed. They too are safe. A mother's eyes are on them, and her arms stretched out in love desire her rebel sons. Yes, that's it. What the white gods had missed. I didn't remember it, but that's it exactly. It's strange. When I read, I see only what's needed at the moment. The rest seems to go unnoticed. And then, as soon as it's needed, it comes back. Yes, that's it. That's what just happened. It's exactly like pulling open a curtain. Everything is waiting there behind. It's difficult for me to speak during these experiences because French comes to me more spontaneously. And the experiences all happen in English. Sri Aurobindo's power is so much with them. 27th January, 1962. The passage about the white gods. What was it that the white gods had missed? But Sri Aurobindo has written it all down in full right here in the aphorisms. But I also remember reading the tradition before I met Sri Aurobindo. It was like a novel, a, a serialized romance of the world's creation, but it was very evocative. Theon called it the tradition. And that was where I first learned of the Universal Mother's four emanations. When the Lord delegated his creative power to the Mother. And it was identical to the ancient Indian tradition. But told like a nursery story. Anyone could understand. It was an image, like a movie. And very vivid. So she made her first four emanations. The first was consciousness and light arising from Satchitananda. The second one was Ananda and love. The third was life. And truth was the fourth. Then, so the story goes, conscious of their infinite power, Instead of keeping their connection with the Supreme Mother and through her with the Supreme, instead of receiving indications for action from him and doing things in proper order, they were conscious of their own power and each one took off independently to do as he pleased. They had power and they used it. They forgot their origin. And because of this initial oblivion, consciousness became unconsciousness, and light became darkness, ananda became suffering, love became hate, life became death, and truth became falsehood. And they were instantly thrown headlong into what became matter. According to Theon, the world as we know it is the result of that. And that was the Supreme himself in his first manifestation. But the story is easy to understand and quite evocative. On the surface, 
for intellectuals, it is very childish. But once you have the experience, you understand it very well. I understood and felt the thing immediately. And once the world has become like that, has become the vital world in all its darkness, and they, from this vital world, have created matter. The Supreme Mother sees the result of her first four emanations, and she turns towards the Supreme in a great entreaty. Now that this world is in such a dreadful state, it has to be saved. We can't just leave it this way, can we? It has to be saved. The Divine Consciousness must be given back to it. What to do? And the Supreme says, thrust yourself into a new emanation, an emanation of the essence of love, down into the most material matter. That meant plunging into the earth. The earth had become a symbol and a representation of the whole drama. Plunge into matter. So she plunged into matter. And that became the primordial source of the divine within material substance. And from there, as it is so well described in Savitri, she begins to act as a leaven in matter, raising it up from within. And as she plunged into the earth, a second series of emanations was sent forth, the gods, to inhabit the intermediary zones between Satchinanda and the earth. And these gods, Mother laughs, well, great care was taken to make them perfect, so they wouldn't give any trouble. But they are a bit, a bit too perfect, aren't they? Yes, a bit too perfect. They never make mistakes. They always do exactly as they're told. In short, rather lacking in initiative. They do have some, but in fact, they were not surrendered in the way a psychic being can be because they had no psychic in them. The psychic being is the result of the descent. Only human beings have it. And that's what makes humanity so superior to the gods. Theon insisted greatly on this throughout his story. Humans are far superior to gods and should not obey them. They should only be in contact with the Supreme in his aspect of perfect love. I don't know how to put it. To me, these gods always seemed, not those described in the Puranas, they're different. Well, not so very different. But the way Theon presented it, them, they seemed just like a bunch of marshmallows. It's not that they had no power. They had a lot of power. But they lacked that psychic flame. And to Theon, the god of the Jews and the Christians, was an Asura. This Asura wanted to be unique, and so he became the most terrible despot imaginable. Anatole France said the same thing. I know now that 
Anatole France, had never read Theon's story. But I can't imagine where he picked this up. It, it's in the Revolt of the Angels. He says that Satan is the true God and that Jehovah, the only God, is the monster. And when the angels wanted Satan to become the one and only God, Satan realized he was immediately taking on all Jehovah's failings. So he refused. Oh no, thank you very much. It's a wonderful story, and in exactly the same spirit as what Theon used to say. The very first thing I asked Anatole France, I told you I met him once. Mutual friends introduced us. The first thing I asked him was, have you ever read the tradition? He said, no. I explained why I had asked, and he was interested. He said his source was his own imagination. He had caught that idea intuitively. Well, if you speak this way to philosophers and to metaphysicians, they'll look at you as if to say, you must be a real simpleton to believe all that claptrap. But these things are not to be taken as concrete truths. They are simply splendid images. Through them, I really did come in contact very concretely with the truth of what caused the world's distortion much better than with all the Hindu stories, far more easily. Buddhism and all similar lines of thought took the shortest path. The desire to exist is what has caused all the trouble. If the Lord had refrained from having this desire, there would have been no world. It's childish, very childish, really a much too human way of looking at the problem. To see it from the angle of delight, of being, is qualitatively far superior. But then there's still the problem of why it all became the way it is. The usual reply is, because all things were possible, and this is one possibility. But it's not a very satisfying feeling. Yes, all right, that's just the way it is. It is a fact. People used, used to ask Theon, too, why did it happen like this? Why? Wait till you get to the other side, then you will know. And meanwhile, do what's necessary to get there. That's the most urgent thing. But there is one advantage. Without those beings, without the world's distortion, many things would be lacking. Those beings potentially embodied certain absolutely unique elements. Understandably so, since they were the first wave. And precisely because they, were st they still were the supreme, to such a great extent, each one felt he was the supreme, and that was that only it wasn't quite sufficient for the simple reason that they were already divided into four. And one single division is enough to make everything go wrong. It's really understandable. It's not something essentially evil, but a question of wrong functioning. It's not the substance, not the essence, 
the essence isn't evil, but the functioning is faulty. Third February, nineteen sixty two. Besides, if you remember the beginning of Savitri, I read it only recently. I hadn't known it. In the second canto, speaking of Savitri, he says that she has come, he puts it poetically, of course, to <laughs> laughing, kick out all the rules, all the taboos, the rules, the fixed laws, all the closed doors, all the impossibilities, to undo it all. I went one better. I didn't even know the rules, so I didn't need to fight them. All I had to do was ignore them, so they didn't exist. That was even better. But now, I have first to undo and then redo the sheer waste of time. 17 February, 1962. A line from Savitri constantly haunts or assails me. It's when the Lord proposes that she come live a blissful life above and she replies, no, there are still too many battles to wage on earth. That went deep into me, and it returns each time difficulties arise, as if to say, don't complain. And there are plenty. <laughs> <laughs>